in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, as usual, uh, at this point, I would ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones and other wireless devices, as it has the potential at least to disrupt proceedings, but uh, also remind uh, others uh, with us here this morning that, um, that officials and indeed members may be using tablet devices instead of the hard copies of their, 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 their papers. Um, um, can I intimate at this point um, uh, apologies from uh, Richard Simpson uh, and Richard Lyle and welcome Dennis Robertson uh, as the substitute for Richard Lyle. Always a pleasure, um, Dennis, to have you along. Um, our only item on the agenda today is our um, initial scrutiny of the Commonwealth Games, uh, which of course were held in Glasgow this summer, who could forget? Um, uh, members uh, will recall that um, Glasgow 2014 Chief Executive David, David Gravenberg was scheduled to give evidence last month, was, but was unable to attend due to a family emergency. Um, Mr Gravenberg has since moved on to a new post with the Commonwealth Games Federation, uh, and we wish him well in that. And uh, we, we may also hear from him, uh, maybe in that role at some future point, who, who, who knows, um, um, when we have a f further discussion about uh, uh, the, uh, and evidence about the, the legacy partners, uh, um, including the Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council. All of that said, can um, uh, uh, I say that we are delighted to have with us today Gordon Arthur, Chief Communications Officer of Glasgow 2014, uh, and Kenny Stewart, Government Relations Manager, Glasgow 2014. And uh, I believe, Gordon, that you have some opening remarks, and then we will proceed to questions. Is that, is that OK? Thank you very much. Convener, members of the Health and Sport Committee, I'd like to thank you for inviting us today to speak to you um, about the Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games. It feels strange to talk about the Games in the past sense, um, but having witnessed 11 um, extraordinary days of sport and culture, we are now in a position to look back um, and uh, consider what we have all uh, achieved together. Uh, the Games has changed us. It's changed Glasgow. It's changed Scotland. It's given the rest of the world a new understanding of the city of the country and of our people. We all have memories of the Games that will stay, us, stay with us for many years to come. Uh, it may be Usain Bolt dancing to the proclaims at Hamden. It might be the cheers of Uganda at the Rugby Sevens um, uh, at Ibrox. Um, it might be the endurance shown by the road race cyclists on the final day of the Games in that appalling rain. Um, when uh, something like 240 cyclists started and I think uh, half a dozen finished um, the race. And whatever memory you take away with you, um, we've seen widespread agreement that Scotland's biggest ever festival of cultural uh, sport and culture has been a huge uh, success. The Games made history. Uh, in sporting terms, we had nine world records and 142 Commonwealth records set during the Games. We had the biggest integrated parasport programme uh, in Commonwealth Games history. And we had a groundbreaking partnership with UNICEF uh, and the Commonwealth Games Federation, which has raised so far £5 million to put children first across the Commonwealth. Our work on accessibility has set a new bar in sharing the excitement of sport. A £3 million investment to create permanent improved accessibility for facilities in Hamden was just one example of the many lasting accessibility improvements that have come about as a result of the Games. We published a procurement sustainability policy, a position on human rights, and were the first Commonwealth Games to achieve ISO 20121 status um, for our commitment to the environment and sustainability. In so many ways, we have sought to set new standards for the Commonwealth Games. And one of the things that we believe that set Glasgow apart from other host cities is not just what we've delivered, but how we've delivered it. We've worked incredibly closely with our Games partners. The 1,500-strong team of people at the organising committee has kept people at the heart of our story. And throughout the journey of the Games, we've been inspired by the Commonwealth Games Federation's values of humanity, equality and destiny. 
We've enjoyed incredible support from the people of Scotland, whether they volunteered as Clydesiders, took part in a legacy project, or bought tickets and cheered on the athletes. We strive to maximise the legacy ambitions of our partners, and we've worked hard to make Commonwealth Games athletes and the young people of Glasgow and Scotland an integral part of a world-class, community-relevant Games that has made the people of Scotland proud. The Games has left an economic, social and sporting legacy. There's a wealth of evidence about the opportunities that have been brought about by the Games, whether it be in jobs, in training, in new and improved venues, community and cultural initiatives, or just the increase in confidence and, prof and profile that comes with hosting such a successful event. And our Games partners, the City Council, uh, Scottish Government and Commonwealth Games Scotland will continue to assess the impact of the Games long after we at the organising committee have packed up and gone home. Glasgow and Scotland raised the bar. We created history. We did it in partnership and we did it thanks to the incredible support of the people of Scotland and the Commonwealth. Everyone in Scotland should be very proud of what's been achieved and we're all ready to build on it in the months and years to come. Thank you once more for inviting us this morning and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Rhoda Grant. Legacy. There was an awful lot in the run-up to the Games and indeed during the Games about the legacy of the Games. What do you see being the main legacy of the Games? Well, I think there have been um, a, a, a huge um, range of different legacy projects which have set um, a, a, a completely new um, uh, standard, I think, for legacy planning ahead of the Games, um, which is to the great um, pre credit of everybody involved in bidding for these Games. Um, I think the economic legacy has been very significant, um, particularly in Glasgow, where over £200 million worth of the Tier 1 contracts for the Games were awarded to um, Glasgow-based contracts, but also across um, Scotland. Um, and the way we procured a lot of these contracts ensured that apprenticeships were created um, and that local people um, got the benefit of the trickle-down um, in the supplier relationships um, from a lot of these. So I think the economic legacy has been very um, significant uh, from the Games. The, the new venues um, were all open a year before the Games, which has never been seen before, so people have had the opportunity to use the venues. And it's very clear that people are using the new venues not just from the very local immediate area around about, but, for example, uh, the um, velodrome which was created for the, um, for the Games uh, is the busiest velodrome in the world at the moment. It's got more people coming through the door um, than any other velodrome and um, people are having to wait up to three months to get on the induction program to use it and people are traveling a long distance to do that and we have created venues and an event I think which have inspired people to get um, more involved in in sport and that over time should have significant um, social um, and health uh, legacies as well which I know the government and council um, are very keen to be um, to be monitoring and I think also it's um, uh, it's been a, a huge confidence boost for the nation um, and for the city of Glasgow, which now ranks in the, well into the top 10 cities for hosting major events around the world. Um, in the lead-up to the Games, it has already secured things like the World um, Gymnastics Championships for next year, um, the IPC Parasport Swimming World Champi Championships um, next year. So the city is already bringing significant new major events in which in economic terms all of which will create a very significant um, impact on the city going forward as it makes its long-term transition from its industrial heritage to its um, its future as a major events destination so i think those um, are the things that i would summarize as being um, the the things which are very visible um, already from the games and and hopefully will continue to be a benefit um, as we measure and track these things through the partners in the years to come. Yeah. I think I would add um, the, the work that we've done to try and put young people at the centre of the Games. Uh, we've had a tremendously successful education programme, um, which we developed with partners, including Scottish Government Education Scotland. Um, we believe that's reached around about a million learners across, across the Commonwealth, 250,000 of those uh, here, here in Scotland. Additionally, um, we've seen some really great uh, initiatives that have been done through smart and sensible procurement. For example, our host broadcaster training uh, initiative with the, the host broadcaster, which 
saw over 600 young people on relevant courses at further and higher education courses, uh, mm -hmm. institutions here in Scotland, being trained um, by the by the host broadcast, broadcaster, and over 200 of those young people actually went on to roles covering the games, which has created an entire new generation of uh, young media and broadcast professionals in Scotland. Rosa. The record. Can I ask about, um, I know when we were looking forward to the Games, there was thoughts about how you would engage the local community, maybe people who had been out of work um, in volunteering and the like. And I think the Clyde Siders programme was really successful. I think a lot of people recognised it kind of, I suppose, the warmth and local community and involvement that was a part of that. What um, steps have been taken to kind of continue those people's involvement to see if they can become involved maybe in future events or um, kind of their personal development rather than just leaving it at the end of the games and saying that's that that's over how, how do you keep those people engaged and and help them to move on and build on the success that they've had the um uh, the glasgow 2014 games has been the first games where there's been in advance of the games an agreement as to as to how to try and keep um, these uh, people involved in, in the past, even with London 2012, there's been um, real challenges with um, data protection um, in, in the period post, um, post games. Um, so uh, we were able, through the, through the partnership, to agree um, a couple of years out from, from the games that we would um, ensure that all the data um, that was collected with people's permission in, in the recruitment period for the client side of programme would be passed on um, to volunteer development Scotland, so that we would have a pool of people who had been involved in uh, in the games um, and who had uh, had shown a, uh, an interest in being involved, uh, that they would then have opportunities to be involved in their local communities and in national events uh, going forward. And I think that's a very important step forward uh, that we've got. So we know who these people are. We've got one um, organisation in Scotland who are um, who are completely. Uh, focus on, on on volunteering and and they have that data to ensure that um, people can get uh, can get um, uh, the the awareness levels up of other events going on in in, in their area and I think that's one important part of how we've um, how we've sought to get uh, people in local communities involved through the games but it's it's by no means the only one and I, I think I would go right back to our um, approach to the De Delhi flag handover ceremony in in 2010 where um, in, in, in most organising committees, when they go to the, the, the closing ceremony, the previous games take a very small group of people, and, and, um, uh, and in London's case, they took a, a big red London bus out to Beijing for the Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games. They, they, they brought a very kind of um, uh, digital approach to it, and very, very few um, people, occasionally high-profile people. What we decided to do. Um, in 2009 was recruit people from every corner of Scotland, from every community across the country, and get them involved in a, in a mass cast approach to that flag handover ceremony. Um, they, they spent, gave up weeks of their time preparing um, through boot camps and induction programmes. We flew them out to Delhi. They performed in the stadium in front of a, a huge global audience, um, and then we brought them back. And those people stayed involved. They were involved in the Clyde Cider recruitment um, program, and we had a good number of Clyde Siders who'd been performers um, in in Delhi, as well as as, as um, ceremonies cast members as well. So, um, through that program, through our Lead 2014 um, development program, we've we've had a lot of uh, programs run by the organising committee. Let alone all the legacy programs run by the government, uh, in particular, to get people in, in communities really involved in in the games and to try and do that in a way that would ensure that that involvement. Um, stayed um, active uh, after the games rather than it just being a kind of one-off, two-week thing that, that was then quickly forgotten. How, how much, what was the final cost of the Commonwealth Games? Well, we haven't published the final figure yet. The, um, the accountants are still um, closing down contracts, so we, we're, we're in that kind of dissolution phase at the moment. We're down to a, um, a few dozen staff um, and uh, we've still got a number of large contracts which are being, being wound down and there'll be obviously variations within those. So um, I think you can expect um, before the end of this year that the, the final um, tally will be, um, will be published. 
um, we, um, we are confident that we will have delivered the games um, under budget, um, and, uh, and it's a question of, of, of how much um, of, of the full budget for the games, including security, which was actually the responsibility of the Scottish Government, um, was 575.6 million pounds. 575. And 90 million pounds of that was the security budget, which was, um, which was uh, uh, the responsibility of the Scottish Government. Is that the Scottish Government's view that it will be coming in on budget and everything? The reason, the reason I'm asking because there was some speculation that additional money had to be put in. And I think there was 370 odd million pounds being spent. There was another 80 million pounds that was added to that. You know, so we're into you know 450 or upwards. Uh, and I just think it's worth mentioning when we talk about legacy. This is a significant investment mm. from Scottish people. And what we really want to hear about in the committee here today is how will we ensure that that, that, that significant investment actually delivers volunteering uh, capacity for more than the fortnight? How will it, will, how will it be measured? How are we going to see that through? How are we going to see, from this committee's point of view, how are we going to ensure that those volunteers are going to be in those communities that find it harder to participate, where there's fewer volunteers? So can you tell us something about how that will be handled, measured and delivered over the next couple of years? Are, are, is there any signs that there is increased volunteering in these, these areas? Well, I think, uh, I think our, our role really has been through this process is to ensure that through our recruitment of, of volunteers that we've recruited them in a way and got them involved in a way which ensures that their, um, their games experience, the, the, the inspiration that has been brought to them by the games um, has, has ignited that desire to, 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 to get involved and stay involved in their communities. The, the, the process really from here on that you're asking about is one which will be run by the games partners with a lot of support of a lot of community organisations like Volunteer Development Scotland. And I think um, when you mentioned earlier, convener, that you will be having a session with the partners um, talking about these issues, it will be their plans really that you're, you're asking about which will ensure um, the, the success or otherwise of, of, that, um, uh, of that ongoing involvement in, in community volunteering and other things in, uh, in the years ahead. And I know they have an ambitions and aspirations that it's, it, it is for the long term and they're, they're planning on measuring a lot of different outcomes from the Games over the long term. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't know at this stage? At this stage, it's, it's very hard to say. It's, it's really a very short period of time since, um, since the Games to be measuring a lot of these things and, and an awful lot of games legacy will be measured over you know, 5, 10, 15 years, not uh, over a few months in the immediate aftermath um, of, uh, of, of the games. It is just worth adding there. Um, Gordon talked about how we set in, uh, in, in advance of the games, we put in place a data sharing agreement with Volunteer, uh, Volunteer Scotland. Um, that, actually, that referred to the entire applicant pool of 50,811. We saw a tremendous uptake in rate, I think, of 87% of people opting in uh, for, the, for the data to be passed on. So that's, that, that data is now with VS. Uh, they're already starting to take advantage of that with the development of um, what they're calling My Volunteer Account, which allows people kind of access to personalised services. I think we'll start to see that uh, hopefully have an effect uh, over the next wee while. But it's also worth adding, actually, that uh, I mean, working with the likes of uh, VS and with Skills Development Scotland and others, we did create uh, a microsite for all applicants um, to, uh, to volunteer at the Games, which has signposted them on to, uh, to various organisations uh, in terms of future volunteering, future employment uh, and skills training, other aspects of uh, personal so development. Th so there is, there is that database that, that, that people who volunteer has been shared with these other organisations? Yeah, so all the, all the contact information, including the, the kind of yep. the demographic information. So what, and so what, forth is the, what is the target of that 85,000 that you would expect to, to uh, go on to volunteer? I, as an organisation, we, we don't have a target in that regard. I suspect that VS probably do, but uh, I don't know what that target is at the moment. Okay. Participation levels, um, have we got any indication of them? Has, has there been a surge? and demand, have we been able to meet that demand during the games and since? 
in terms of participation at sports clubs and so forth? Yeah, sports or, clubs yeah. and other information that's coming back on the... I don't think there's a new round of statistics on that as yet. I mean, anecdotally, we've certainly heard uh, about very busy clubs. Um, but at this stage, uh, you know, just uh, just a couple of months after the games, I think it remains anecdotal at this stage. OK, OK. Uh, and we do have, uh, Convener, we, the, the programme of introduction of new community sports hubs that's been rolled out over the last um, few years has certainly hugely increased the capacity and the facilities available to people who um, who we hope have been inspired by the games to um, to, to, to find a way of getting into sport and, and, and leisure and, and finding ways to um, to 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 be able to um, to do that in their local communities. So there's certainly you know we know that the vast majority of those community sports hubs have now been um, delivered and that those you know facilities uh, are in place and being well used. But we don't know as yet. We don't have data yet on that, but again, yeah. these... It's, it's just a particular interest for the community, given our focus on community sport, access, participation, how they're supporting the sport. Yeah. Gil Patterson, um, and Nanette, you wanted to... Come. I've answered some of the <coughs> points that I wanted to raise. It was in the back of Rona's uh, question. It, it's quite clear from uh, the work that was carried out in East End of Glasgow, that the actual built legacy is there. You can see it and you can touch it. And I think uh, it's a wonderful uh, sight to see compared to what was there before. And I doubt very much if we could have this transformation, to be quite frank, taking place without uh, the, the games uh, being situated there. And I think it's wonderful. And uh, certainly the social aspect of that, I think, will last for a long time too. And, and I don't grudge them. I don't come from that area. Uh, and I'm not a Celtic supporter. And I know how it's also transformed uh, Celtic Park uh, in a very, very positive sense, uh, in my view. Uh, how it's located and everything like that is transformed. It's wonderful. But I don't grudge them that at all. And I wondered that what the rest of Scotland would be benefiting from in legacy terms. I know that the built uh, legacy, uh, you can't have it everywhere. But certainly... The sporting legacy, the, the involvement, is there any indication what's happened in other places in Scotland that's not been close to it, but, you know, looking on in the screen and, and maybe activity taking place because of it, is there any evidence to say where we're at with that? Well, if I could pick up the comments on the built legacy <coughs> first, because I think it is um, really important. And, and, and the, um, the, the immediate and obvious things that people see in, in the east end of Glasgow, the new um, Emirates Arena and, and the, the Athletes' Village um, and the, 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 the Clyde Gateway Road, which, which goes around there, are all, are all very immediate around, around the games um, venues. But uh, when I first started working on the organising committee in um, almost exactly six years ago, actually, in my first week, I was taken on a tour around um, that part of the city by Councillor Archie Graham and uh, the head of... Um, of uh, Clyde Gateway um, and the transformation beyond that which has been um, I think inspired and, and driven by the game's involvement is, is absolutely huge and is only barely starting if you look at the housing developments and other things which have been, um, have been proposed for the, the coming years that area of the city is going to continue to see um, a huge amount of, of development and it's not just um, in areas like housing the, the, the extension of the M74 which um, everyone in this room will know was was agonized over for for many many years um was finally built and it was was crucially important for a successful delivery of the games but that has also delivered um huge economic benefits and, and big areas of of that part of the city which um have been derelict for for decades have now got industrial sheds and office buildings and other employers coming into the area creating um creating work and creating hope for people um, living in, in that part of the city. So it, it is absolutely enormously transformational. And those businesses themselves um, will be doing business um, right across Scotland. They won't just be doing business, but they will be employing people in the, in the immediate uh, vicinity of, of, of the area, I'm sure. So um, I think all of that has been huge. And we, we have been able to, um, to see the benefit from a business perspective of the games on, on communities right across Scotland because we've been able to see where the Tier 1... Um, contracts have, have, have gone and, and companies right across the country have benefited from tier one contracts um, with the games. We've also really encouraged 
the, the people who've won tier one contracts to, um, to develop their local supply chains. And there's some um, really strong evidence from com uh, companies like McAlpine's who built the, the Emirates Arena, um, who have um, a huge supply chain right across the UK, didn't have a particularly strong supply chain in, in, in Scotland, um, and came across um, new suppliers for tier two and tier three contracts um, through that process. And when you listen to the Scottish director of, of McAlpine's talking about some of the fantastic companies they've worked with in, in their work on, on the games, who they will undoubtedly work with in, in future, um, there's you know, very clear and lasting business benefits from, from a lot of this um, work. But again, coming back to your, the, 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 the second part of your, your question, um, in terms of participation from the point of view of young people in particular and in, in, in sport, um, it is early um, to, 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 um, to be clear about that. There has, um, without question, been anecdotal evidence um, that things have picked up significantly over the last couple of years, not just um, over the last couple of months since the Games, but with the, the lead-up to the Games, people being aware of the Games and being excited about the Games and these fantastic new facilities all being open um, prior to um, a year prior to the Games. Um, that they have been in very, very heavy use. I know, for example, that the swimming pool at Toll Cross, the additional 50-metre swimming pool that was built at Toll Cross as a warm-up pool for the Games, has been um, uh, set aside for elite athlete training and for schools. Um, and it is absolutely solidly booked. And it's not solidly booked at the expense of the 10-lane pool. That's full every day as well. So um, you can see the benefits of a lot of these facilities coming through. But the data which you're, I understand, very keen to see, um, is being um, collated by the government and the council um, and will be published um, in, the, uh, in, 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 the months, uh, in the months ahead, but it, we don't have that data at this stage. Could I just follow up? Just, I missed the point, actually. I think uh, the, the, both the Scottish government and the Glasgow City Council, being two different political entities, if you like, work really, really well together. And I think that's another legacy. You know, it's it's well worth recording that uh, you know if everybody gets together, you can make a big difference. And I think it should. So, and I think the the, the Commonwealth Games Federation made that very clear through the um, through the period leading up, you know, the five year period leading up to the games. That the the, the partnership work they saw in Scotland, um, they saw as being stronger than anywhere else they'd worked, and it's definitely stronger than that which is currently being experienced in the Gold Coast. So they have got, um, again, political parties of, of, of in, in opposition to each other at different levels of government who are um, not able to sit around the same table and work, um, work together. And I know the organising committee in Gold Coast is finding that um, a challenge at this, at this stage um, of the Games. So that there's no question that the partnership working that's been achieved um, for these Games has been huge. And interestingly, if I may add, Convener, um, Councillor Archie Graham was on the organising committee um, board for the Games, um, and he was reporting at our final board meeting last, um, uh, last week that he had got um, the, the, the Glasgow um, uh, Council family together, all the arm's length organisations that, that they have, city property, city building, um, and all the others, about 18 of them, and, and they all reported back to him that they thought the biggest benefit of the games in the city, for the city, in, in, in their world, was the fact that all the alios were, were now working together in a way that they had never done before, because they were forced to come together and work together to d deliver things which the city was massively dependent on at games time. Um, and if they hadn't been able to do that, um, the city would not have been able to, um, to enjoy the successful games that it has. So. That's a good point. We'll go on. You got something small. That, 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 that last point would be very welcome right across the country. I think if we could get the, the same sort of layers of um, across. No, interesting. Can kind it of follow on about really almost access? I mean, I agree the facilities. I haven't seen all the facilities in Glasgow, but the ones I have seen are fantastic. I, I must say, um, it's really accessibility of people from uh, perhaps less well-off communities to these areas. I know when, when our Aberdeen Sports Village, which is also a tremendous facility, when that opened up. Um, very heavily used, uh, as you're saying, the Glasgow ones are, and it still is. But 
we ha did have comments from people in the more, more outlying areas or people from, from poorer parts of the city that they found it difficult to access the, the, the facilities on grounds of expense, distance and that sort of thing. I think you may have partly answered my concerns through your sport, sports hubs uh, res response, but I, I wondered how, how you, you see you know, people who are, who are not readily able to access the, the new facilities and what you see the legacy would be for them going forward. I, I mean, I think the, um, the, the, the challenge that, that you refer to in terms of, of affordability um, for um, a lot of, of, of different sports facilities and, and sports clubs and things is, is, quite, um, is, is quite real, but it's also quite varied. Um, and across different sports, the, 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 the barriers to entry are very, very different. You know, some you can literally kind of buy a pair of trainers and turn up and, and pretty much get involved um, in others where there's more specialist equipment, um, then the costs can be, um, can be more significant. And, and in the case of the velodrome, um, then people have tried to get around that by um, having um, specialist bicycles far higher. They don't expect everyone who comes along to be able to afford um, one of these specialist um, specialist bicycles. Um, in terms of the organising committee, I, mean, I think the thing that, that we did that was most important in this space um, was uh, an awful lot of work in advance, um, which resulted in us having an incredibly affordable ticketing programme for the Games. Um, you know, the, the big thing that we could do as an organising committee was, was really get people inspired to get involved. And, and then when they went to get involved, hopefully the facilities would be in place, the coaches would be in place, the equipment would be in place. Um, but our big task in many ways was, was the getting people inspired in, in, in the first place. And we did a huge amount of work, again, as a partnership, agreeing the principles of our ticketing program 18 months before it went live. Um, and again, the government and the council were, were absolute um, and, and very clear advocates that we had to have the most accessible ticketing program ever for a games. So we were the first games, for example, to have um, uh, specialist price tickets for children and the entry price across all of our sports and every session of sport um, uh, was, was set very low. So for all sports, it was £7.50 for a concession um, ticket and you could get into any sport with, with concession tickets. Uh, so we, we worked hard at that, but we also worked really hard at accessibility through things like not having a, um, um, a dedicated um, credit card provider for the games, which is very typically, if you look at sport around the world now, the financial services sponsors of the games always involve um, you know, major credit card uh, providers. Um, and with that comes the exclusivity of you can only buy tickets through that credit card. So a lot of people who tried to buy tickets for the Olympic Games who didn't have a Visa card you know, found that barrier really difficult. But not only did we not do that, um, which was a very conscious decision that we weren't going to do that, we took that five years out from the Games, we also um, made big efforts to print our ticketing programme um, and make that accessible through a lot of retail outlets. Um, we accepted applications on a printed um, application form. Um, we accepted a, a variety of different payment methods beyond card payments, um, online so people could send in postal orders or checks. Um, relatively small numbers of people did so, but the important thing was that we made as many of these um, opportunities available to as many people as possible and spoke to as broad a community as we could possibly speak to to, to try and get people really wanting to be, to be part of the Games. And again, I think, um, I think it will come back to um, the future sessions of, of this committee where the, 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 um, the Games partners are able to give, um, to give evidence to be able to demonstrate through, for example, Sports Scotland's um, uh, statistics that they record how the, the, the ripple effect has gone out from the work done by the organising committee with the partner support um, over communities um, and over time. Have you any knowledge or, or, or evidence that the, there's more of a demand for increasing facilities available at the sports hubs across the country? I know there are a lot of them now, and presumably they have varying degrees of, of facilities and, and accessibility as well. Have you any knowledge of any pressure to develop these following directly on from the Commonwealth Games? I think only anecdotal again. I think that yeah. I think the sports hubs all, are all being um, being used extremely well. Um, 
but I think at this stage it is um, it is still anecdotal. I don't know if you've got anything kind of you'd, you'd add to that, but um, you know I, I completely understand why why you, you you're keen to understand the the, the 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 data that flows out of this process. Um, I'm afraid it's just not the organising committee's role to, to to do that because, as I say, in a, a matter of weeks, the vast majority of us will, well, the vast majority have already gone home. That's fine. Thank you. I mean, I mean perhaps just, to, just to, you know, to the lengths that the organisation committee and indeed a decision that was taken pretty early on not to use the single sort of credit card branding. I mean, I don't think we were it was something that were people were fully aware of. I certainly wasn't anyway about those efforts for a, for a small return, but, but was inclusive in that respect. Well, is that something that you would do again? Uh, uh, is, is there anything else that we can do as well as that to encourage wider participation? Because you, you know, I think you went to great lengths there to do that, but um, for a sm very small return, could we have been doing a wee bit you know, is there any other ideas that would reach that group, or, or is it just a question of they might not have had the money, or the money was was, but, was being spent elsewhere? But I, I admire I'm, your efforts anyway to, to reach mm, out. You know, I, I think I mean the, the reason the reason we did that is we did a lot of research as an organising committee um, with the public to find out what was important to them, um, and I personally went along to to a good number of the, the focus groups we ran, which we ran right across. Scotland, and and people aren't shy at telling you, you know, the things that matter to them and th where the barriers are and, and 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 how you can make their lives easier. And that was one of the big things that came out of that process. If if you asked me if I would do it again, the answer to that would be unquestionably yes, um, because I think it's just a really important statement of intent, um, and it does affect an awful lot of people, um, even if they're the minority. There's still an awful lot of people who, who've benefited from that kind of decision. If you had my commercial colleagues sitting alongside me, <laughs> they may have a different view because you know the, the, the minute you exclude a sector for your commercial team to, 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 to go to, to seek revenues, then you are taking um, you know, you, a decision that in this case, quite a wealthy sector of the market, which does support um, sport globally, very heavily, um, you you are saying to that, you know, sector of the market, you, you may not go and 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 and, uh, and seek a deal. Um, so it it has, you know, it has real benefits at a community level, and accessibility level, uh, inclusivity level. Uh -huh. But 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 these things always come with a cost somewhere else. Uh -huh. um, so I think you know the, the one thing I would say is that um, in in moving towards the delivery of any major events, you can never do enough research. You know, find out from people what it is they want out of events, um, and and they will. You know, if you if you give them the opportunity, they will they will always tell you. Um, and 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 it's you build up a very clear picture of of the things that matter. Um, you know, the, the, I remember in the ticketing ones, one of the great cynicisms. Um, in, in the people we talked to about about uh, facilities for getting to the games um, was, well, you'll price the tickets really low, but then you'll do park and ride and you'll charge us a fortune for the park and ride. You know, so you, can, you actually you learn all the way through these research processes. And again, we were able to launch um, our park and ride with, with very, very accessible pricing. Um, and we had a huge effort across the games which from a health perspective was really important, as well as from an organisational perspective, to encourage people to, to leave the car at home um, and, and, to not, um, and to not try and drive to, to the games. And <clears throat> the statistics um, that we collated from, from spectators on that were, were, were huge. I mean, 46% of people walked to venues um, at some point. 38% of people used um, the bus, 13% um, the subway. Um, and a very, very small proportion of people who came to the games um, brought their car. So, you know, I think, um, uh, I think if you do the research early, you understand um, how people are thinking and feeling, um, then you can, you can, you know, make sure that you're organisationally set up to deliver um, in a way that will, will meet their needs, which will enable you to achieve, achieve other goals like the, the very significant reduction of vehicles in the city at games time which we needed to achieve to enable all the other vehicles we were bringing in 
the buses and, and, and other things to transport the games family around to enable them the space to be able to do that. Bob. Uh, thanks, convener. I suppose as, as a Glasgow MSP, I should start off by thanking the organisation committee for, for an amazing job. Uh, very well done. I should also say gently, actually, you were in listening mode and I think people moved on very quickly in relation to using the Red Road Flats as part of the opening ceremony. But the, the thing about that was once the city moved on, we just moved on and it was a wonderful opening ceremony. Um, my constituency office uh, sits in Sucky Hall Street. I, I saw for the, the fortnight there how, how the city changed and, and it was an amazing thing to say. And that change is still, still really relevant. I mean, some of the main thoroughfares in Glasgow has, has still not seen a diminishing of the interest from tourists and visitors and, and it's been a wonderful experience and, and I can't commend all the partners enough. Um, two or three hopefully focused questions, convener, uh, driven from some personal experience. So I got to go to one event. I, got, I never thought I would go and see a heavyweight weightlifting female contest um, at the SECC, but I did. Uh, and it was remarkable. And I got a ticket uh, the day before by turning up at a ticket booth at George Square and bumped into a neighbour of mine doing exactly the same thing. So accessibility and affordability of tickets would be the... I'm not just telling the story for the sake of it, I can assure you. Accessibility and affordability of tickets. Is there scope, do you think, maybe for a a national ticketing strategy for large-scale sporting and similar events to make sure that the lessons learned for how you organise and make affordable and accessible, also at short notice, tickets. Um, is, there more, is there lessons to be learned to be rolled out nationally? I accept it would have to be through local authority partners and other stakeholders. But do you think there's progress to be made in the future in terms of getting ticketing strategies right for other major events? Um. I'm not sure that it needs to go as far as a national ticketing strategy, but I do think through the transfer of knowledge from, um, from the Games that there will be a huge amount for people to learn from in a number of different areas. Um, tick ticketing is one. The food charter that we, um, we put in place with a lot of hard work over two or three years to make sure that the sourcing of foods and the quality of foods at the Games set, set a new benchmark for events in Scotland. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of different things of this sort which people can turn to and will be able to turn to and say, well, how did they do it and, and will that work for us? The, the thing that I would caution is that events are very different um, and, and multi-sport events in particular are very, very different to single sport events in, in, in scale and, and, um, and just about... Every, every way, because the, the, the layers you add on bring with them so many more complications than you do if you have even a really big single sport um, event like, like, for example, the Ryder Cup coming, um, coming last week. So um, I, I think the thing that's most important is that through the, 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 the national agencies and through the Games partners that um, the, 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 the knowledge that's been developed during the period of, of planning for the Games um, over an extended period of time is available to others um, and, and that they can look at it and work out which of it is relevant to them and, and which isn't. Because, you know, demographically, you know, we were very, very, very keen to ensure that, that we spoke to the entire, um, the, the, the entire nation. There are you know, other events which um, are, by their nature, more exclusive and... and you would you would just approach them in 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 a different way um, because you're talking to a different uh, and very specific audience. Um, so I think it, it it you can't have a too generalist a, a, an approach. Um, but I do think there's there's real learnings for people um, in 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 a whole range of different uh, events that um, that will be valuable over the next few years. And then of course, you know, t communications will move on. Uh, and, and, you know, the way we all communicate with each other, it makes a massive difference when it comes to things like ticketing. Should be a key underlying principle for all major sporting events in Scotland. I accept those business models. I think, uh, Mr Arthur, you already pointed out that um, there's tensions between maximising income and business models and accessibility for all, but I'm just suggesting that perhaps as part of any organisation's corporate and social responsibilities, 
be it a football game, be it the Commonwealth Games, be it a single sport or a multi-sport event, that some form of affordability check so that all sections of society, be it the Ryder Cup, I should have to say as well, that there's maybe some underlying principles which could be disseminated across Scotland. Not statutory, but there's maybe some underlying principles that 2014 used that others would, would be quite good if they looked at that, do you think? I think events, having a national events agency, you know, we are in a position where that, that the, those kind of things can be, um, you know, can be communicated and shared really um, very effectively. Um, and, and, you know, we are in a good position from that point of view. I think Scotland does put out a very effective Team Scotland approach when it's bidding for, um, bidding for events, for example, um, and um, the different agencies involved in that and, and Events Scotland at the heart of it um, put them in you know, in a very, um, in a very strong position to be able to do that. No, it was positive. I don't want to labour my point on that. Because, you know, I think, I think I've kind of made the point. Um, we can be, uh, another, and I, I, I can assure you, it's a story with, with a purpose. Uh, Ross Murdoch, when he won his medal, had my two wee nieces uh, delirious with delight because they both do swim uh, at the same pool in the Vale of Leaven that Ross, Ross's family, uh, are still uh, involved with, and it made it local not just national, not just Team Scotland, but it made it local to them. Um, the point I'd like to elicit from that is that seemed to be the story right across Scotland, particularly because of the size of the Scottish team. So going forward, do you think it's pretty important that as long as people are meeting qualifying standards and can meet personal best benchmarks, um, and for some people that will be getting to the final heat or getting to the final itself is a huge achievement for some, but in terms of the motivation, participation, sporting heroes and everything else, the size of the Scottish team was vital and actually going forward that sets a new benchmark for future Scottish teams, even when they're competing in Commonwealth Games much further afield. I think the point you make is a really valid one. The, the, the more widespread that inspiration is, is rooted through the athletes winning medals and through their performances and into communities, the, the, the bigger impact um, it will have. Um, operationally, the, 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 um, the way the Commonwealth Games organises um, its funding of teams to come to the Games is they work on a team size calculator, and that team size calculator um, looks at the size of the team that's um, performed for each country over the last three games. So Scotland will have a, a big team from, from a domestic games where it's had very little in the way of travel and transportation costs and, and accommodation costs and things, and a, a fairly big team in, in the previous two games for Delhi and, and, and Melbourne. But when it comes to funding Team Scotland for, um, for the Commonwealth Games in the Gold Coast, um, it will be done on an average of those th three, and the Commonwealth Games Federation, through the organising committee, will fund um, a team up to the average of the three Scotland teams from Melbourne, Delhi and, and Glasgow. And I say all of that because um, it's not simply a, a, about meeting the qualifying um, criteria. There will be financial pressures on the team, um, even if they achieve um, uh, you know, uh, high levels of, of performance in trying to qualify for the team, there will be financial pressures which will make it harder for Team Scotland to take such a big team to the Gold Coast than they had for, um, for a home games. Um, but in terms of your, your basic point about, um, about the inspiration being rooted back into communities, then, then the broader that is, um, then clearly the, 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 the greater impact it's likely to have over time. Well, I hope Corporate Scotland convener is listening to those financial pressures that that will be taking place going, going forward, as is, I hope, are the media, because there's no point in having a wonderful, successful Scottish team elsewhere in the world if it doesn't get a very similar exposure to the types of uh, media exposure, the wonderful media exposure we had when, when it was our home games. F final question, convener, if, if, if that's OK. No story this time. You'll be glad to hear from Mr Stewart and Mr Arthur. But, um, quite often, shiny new facilities, and there are fantastic facilities in Glasgow, uh, quite often lead to people who are already physically active being more physically active in nicer facilities. And I think other members have made the point about how, I mean, and Gil Parks made the point about, about Glasgow and the rest of Scotland. But actually, if you, if you stay in North Glasgow, uh, so, some of these facilities, uh, in a deprived community, some of these wonderful facilities in East End 
might as well be in Aberdeen, mm -hmm. and I've been to Aberdeen Sports Village, it's fantastic. So it's more about, um, in terms, I know it's other partners that will have to do that tracking exercise. Would you agree with me that tracking exercise of one of the legacy successes for the Games shouldn't be about people being more physically active, although that's important, but those who are not normally physically active taking it up, and that when we do that, we should make sure that we are closing the inequalities that, quite frankly, exist in in society in terms of those who are least likely to be physically active. So it's just, I know you're not doing the tracking exercise, the Cabinet Secretary was very clear, there's some baselines that exist there, and they'll be tracking forward on that, but would that be a key component for yourselves in relation to legacy? I, I think it needs to be, from the point of view of, of, of the aspirations that the bid team set out with, you know, 10 years ago, and, and I, I think it was reasonably clearly um, set out at that stage that, that, that the aspiration was to bring more people into um, physical activity who hadn't been in the past um, in, in order to try and improve health and, and, and other um, factors in, uh, in society. So um, I think that does need to be uh, a, 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 crucial, um, a crucial part of, uh, of, of, of that process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Yep. Dennis. Dennis and then Colin. Hey, thank you, convener, and good morning, gentlemen. Um, one of the things that uh, I think that we need to try and ensure is that uh, we continue to um, include, because this is what you, you, you've managed to do something that maybe uh, other sports uh, haven't done in the past, because you're talking about the accessibility, but it was the inclusiveness that, 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 sta that stood out for me, uh, because it was incredible, because the inclusion of the parasports uh, as part of the, 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 the programme, it wasn't an add-on, as happens in some other sports and some other venues. Um, it was just part of the sort of natural program. And those people with uh, disabilities were seen as athletes, and quite rightly so, in their own right. Now, how do we ensure, because the benchmark's been set very high here, uh, how do we ensure that the people with disabilities and our, our sort of next generation of people taking part in the para sports um, are supported and have the access to the facilities uh, on a national basis. But again, uh, you were mentioning the velodrome, and, and uh, uh, that, that one stood out for me because uh, actually Neil Fackey is related to me, um, uh, which is uh, I'm very proud of um, uh, Neil and his achievements. Um, but how do we ensure that people uh, entering into uh, and the up and coming ones have the, the, the access to the facilities? And can I say that I've had lots of emails from people that actually attended um, the, the various uh, uh, sports facilities, people with um, immobility problem, uh, problems uh, using a wheelchair, or people who are deaf or hard of hearing. And every single email has been, um, can I just say, uh, congratulatory in terms of your efforts and the way that you've provided the facilities. Um, so, uh, as a well done from uh, maybe those people from the uh, various uh, communities who support uh, and indeed who are, uh, have disabilities and impairments. Well, uh, I think there's, there's a few things. I mean, the, the Commonwealth Games um, stands out as being the most inclusive of the, the, the major um, international sporting events because of um, the, um, the, the, the integrated programme of um, of, of, of para sports, obviously the Olympic movement has has grown up with a different approach, where you've got um, a different governing body running um, uh, running the para sports um, from from running the, um, the the rest of the Olympic uh, Olympic program. Um, but it has created an opportunity for us, and we've done a huge amount of work um, with the various organisations in Scotland who are responsible for um, disability sport to en engage them in our process as we were planning uh, over the course of the last um, the last five or six um, years uh, and again um, I think it is incredibly important that um, the the step change that's been achieved over the last few years in terms of awareness uh, in terms of accessibility is built on um, from here and, and isn't allowed to um, to, to kind of drift back um, to the level it uh, the level it started at, mm -hmm. um, and and again I think in terms of the um, the uh, the monitoring of that and the, the continued development of that area in uh, in the years to come, um, when you do take uh, evidence from Sports Scotland and, and and other parts of the Games partnership, 
um, in future sessions, then um, you know I think uh, I think uh, those are questions which will will need to be addressed to the people who will be responsible for um, for looking after all se all sections of the sporting um, population going forward. Yeah. How, how do we ensure that the, that inclusion? Um, through the education programme, for instance, Mr Stewart, how do we ensure that, 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 that people with uh, disabilities or impairments have that, um, a, a, I suppose, a accessibility to the facilities, etc.? And I'm just wondering, you know, do, do, are there special time set aside in the velodrome for people to, who, who, to do cycling, for instance, the tandem cycling um, and, and other such things? I'm just wondering, you know, is it... I, I would hate to see it sort of drifting back as to where it was, and it's an add-on, I, I, can I say I think that maybe the, the Olympic Committee need to look at how they, how, how they move forward. Um, but how do we ensure that it remains inclusive and not just an add-on? I, um, I think for me a lot of it comes down to pretty simple things. It's, it's good planning. It's, it's sensible procurement. I mean, for us, obviously, we took the decision uh, that uh, we were going to be as accessible and inclusive as possible, and that obviously cut right across... Um, mobility, access, disability, uh, and obviously our parasport programme as well. We had a dedicated accessibility team to whom great credit is due working on this uh, for a number of years. And I think it's also worth uh, uh, pointing out the, the incredible work that Glasgow City Council and their various contractors have done to actually develop uh, the facilities that we have and the way that they have. I think what we need to see is um, the way that, that we approach the accessibility internally um, we, we had a dedicated team who managed that centrally, but uh, they, they took the sort of mainstreaming approach across the whole business. They made sure that all the different functional areas understood what, what accessibility meant to their programme of work. And they thought about that in the same way that they would think about health and safety or about risk management or equality or whatever else. Um, and that, I mean, when, you, when, when you're building from that kind of solid foundation and from those simple first principles, it makes making decisions... I think a lot easier in this regard. Equally, um, perhaps we'll see um, stronger commitments to uh, to improve levels of accessibility in uh, in public procurement. I would like to think, particularly in relation to sports facilities. I think what Glasgow City Council has done um, in 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 relation to the the venues that have been built uh, for the for the games has been fantastic, and uh, I, th I think hopefully we'll see that uh, that approach replicated across the country in the future. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Colin Keir. Uh, thanks, Convener. Actually, the question's more a supplementary now. Um, after uh, Dennis, uh, I think it was a huge success in terms of the integration of the sports. It was fantastic. Um, one of the <coughs> things that, um, in terms of the planning, obviously it was a, uh, logistically, it would have been a very difficult thing being multi sport. Um, in the past, from what I remember about the Olympics, the, the 10 days of track and field, for instance, and then you had basically at the tail end, you had the, another 10 days of track and field, but with uh, uh, disabled uh, uh, athletes. And it was obviously, in, in which case, there is 20 days worth of sport. And if you're time constrained in terms of how long the Commonwealth or Olympic Games are, how do you compress a full programme of track and field for able-bodied and disabled athletes and, um, you know are events could they be missed out or uh, it's, I, I don't know enough about um, disabled dis athletics whereas um, despite my current shape and weight and whatever um, 35 years ago it used to be my sport was track and field so I'm just trying to fathom out how in a practical way you get 20 days worth of um, track and field athletics crammed into 10 days, if you like. I think it's interesting from the Olympic and Paralympic movements perspective because if you wind back the clock 20 years, um, parasport you know, was, was way down the agenda and was, was virtually invisible to, um, to, to the public. Um, the, the success of establishing the International Paralympic Committee um, and the work that they've done over the last 20 years has created this phenomenal success, which is the Paralympic Games. Um, the, the challenge for the, for the Olympic movement going forward would be even if, and the Paralympic movement, if they wanted to integrate it, it's now so big mm -hmm. that it's, it might almost be impossible 
to do it, and I'm glad that's not my headache to, to, to be working out how that, that could happen. From the point of view of the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Games, um, <clears throat> the integrated program is, is, um, is set out by the Federation. The length of the games is set out by the Federation. Um, so you have to compete, complete the games within, um, within 11 days. As an organizing committee, you can't choose to, to, to just say, well, we'll do it over 15. Um, and the number of parasport events is also laid down by the Federation. And in doing that, they will look at um, a, a whole range of different, um, uh, different initiatives. But, but one of them will be um, they do have some basic rules around, um, uh, around international spread um, and the depth of the talent, um, f whether you're looking at um, uh, para sport or able bodied sport, th th those kind of rules apply. So, um, uh, you know, their sport committee, as they look at this going forward, will undoubtedly want to continue to increase um, the para sport element of, of the games. How that's done in the context of their definition that the games shall only be 11 days um, and the standards they set for qualifying criteria and, and, and other things, and their, their requirement to have a good competition meaning that you need to have representatives of at least you know, three or four of the six regions and at least so many countries um, will, you know, will themselves um, determine to an extent how fast the para-sport part of the overall games um, becomes. Um, it has moved on. We were very keen to move it on, and, and, and we, um, we pushed the CGF um, on a number of these, um, these areas and also for the inclusion of more women's events and shooting and women's boxing, for example, the mixed uh, triathlon. We, 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 were, we were keen to see um, a, a broadening of the sport programme. But then, of course, on top of that as well, the way the Commonwealth Games works is you have 10 core sports and a bidding city can then choose um, up, to seven, up to seven sports from a list of, I think, 16. Um, and every organising committee tends to pick a slightly different um, mix. Judo hadn't been on the programme since Manchester um, and, and it was on the programme and thankfully it was on the programme because Team Scotland did brilliantly at the, um, at the judo as it did in Manchester. Um, but um, tennis was on the programme in, in Delhi and lots of people you know, since then have said to us, why didn't you have tennis on your programme? You must have known Andy Murray was going to be world number one. But when the bid team were working on tennis, um, you know, Andy Murray was still hundred and something in the world rankings and, and people wouldn't have known that. So the, a bid team, when they're looking at bidding for a games, will put together a sports programme based on a number of different factors. Um, but the actual sports pro programme at each games will also determine um, how much the para-sport programme uh, grows over time. So it's, it's, it's a complicated process, but it is all run through the governance of the CGF and, and their sports, uh, sports committee. I mean, if I may, um, it's really, I am aware of the, obviously, there's other sporting international commitments that have to be factored into uh, where these various games play and whatever. And it's just the, it's almost being a victim of their own success. The inspiration that's come from seeing disabled athletes competing at the same time with the same respect from the crowd uh, as uh, able-bodied athletes. And it really was inspiring. It, it, but it's such a massive movement now with um, disabled sports. And it's how do we actually introduce it without cutting away so many strands of it that it becomes um, not quite as inspiring mm. or inclusive. Well, I think at a practical level, um, then again, you know, the, the national governing bodies for, um, for, for sport in this country, Sports Scotland and, and others, um, uh, may have scope to consider when they're doing national championships and, and other events that are run within Scotland, um, whether a, a para-sport programme is included um, in those championships. Um, I couldn't tell you right now how, that's, how that is organised, but that is something p potentially that could be, um, could be looked at going forward to see if there's an opportunity you know, at a year-by-year -year annual championship level to, to, to create that same level of integration. Now in our last five minutes that we're required to conclude the committee as the, the chamber opens for business at 11.40. Are there any other questions? 
No. The, other, the, only, the, the only one that we haven't, you know, maybe mentioned in terms of our briefing and, uh, you know, the post-games assessment, and we've, you know, it's been a really interesting session to, to hear about how much work went in, and, and I think we, we all uh, shared that warm glow and still uh, about the events and the, its impact in, in the whole of the country. But, of course, post-games assessment also look at the, you know, and highlight challenges about... Uh, what might have worked better. Um, so you've got three minutes to tell us what would work better and uh, what advice do you give to the, the as you hand that baton over um, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, the, the people who take on your responsibility and run the next uh, Commonwealth Games? Well, um, David Grevenberg and, um, and a number of other colleagues are on their way as we speak um, <laughs> to the Gold Coast for the official um, handover of transfer of knowledge um, programme. So we have, um, we have written, um, I think, over 80 transfer of knowledge reports, um, which uh, are accessible to the Games partners and, and, and um, are stored through the CGF's um, transfer of knowledge programme. Um, which will um, go into the detail at you know, every level across um, across the, the, the whole organisation of the of the games of, of the things that um, the, the, the things that we learnt through that process and, and uh, the, the transfer of knowledge to Gold Coast has really been going on for the last two or three years anyway yeah. um, through the, the coordination commissions and other events that have taken place. Um, so there is a very thorough process. Um, in, in, in place to make sure that, that everything we've learnt gets passed on from a Commonwealth Games perspective to, um, to the Gold Coast. And I think the, you know, the important thing um, will be how we, how we cement the, the relevance of, of the different bits of that into the way we plan and, and, and deliver major events in Scotland um, for the benefit of, of, of future World Championships and other events that we, um, that we, we, we host here. So um, you know the, the National Events Agency and, and, and others are heavily involved in that process, and, and um, I'm you know, confident that uh, that a lot of that um, a lot of that knowledge will be successfully um, passed across. Okay, and I think that's a, a good note to, to end um, a session on legacy, and uh, no more important le le legacy than to transfer knowledge and, and experience, uh, which others can learn from uh, and I think that's a good note. Can I thank you both um, for the time you've spent with us this morning at the committee and um, uh, the interesting evidence that we've been pr provided which will of course help us as we explore uh, the various aspects of le legacy and um, uh, uh, from a committee uh, viewpoint. Thank you very much for your attendance and evidence this morning. Thank you. Uh, we now close the uh, committee meeting and proceed to the chamber, those who are required.